Hi there, everybody. My name is Chris Whitesides, and I'm coming at you from California State University Northridge Associate Students Outdoor Adventure Program. And I'm super happy to be joining you today for a 30-minute virtual tour of Acadia National Park. We're going to use Google Earth to bounce around 15 different slides um, as we talk about the geologic history, the human history, and some of the animals that you might find in the park when you make your way out there or if you've been and you just want to revisit some of your favorite spots. The quick disclaimer, I am not a scientist, not a biologist, not a geologist, um, and not affiliated with the park in any way, shape, or form. Not a park ranger, just a person that loves to go camping. So please do treat this short virtual tour as just that, as a walk in the park um, with a friend, not with a professional. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump straight into it as we start with our big broad overview of the US. Sorry, Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, because today we are going to make our way over to Maine as we explore Acadia National Park. Before we jump into the geologic history of this area, I wanted to briefly bring up the difference between national parks and national monuments. Terms that we hear thrown out a bunch, but we may not know uh, the factors that go into the creation, establishment, and the rationale for each. National parks take an act of Congress to designate land. We can see up here with this national park NPS system. Um, whereas national monuments only take an act, a presidential act. The differences being national parks are a little bit more centered on uh, purely recreational value, environmental value, where national monuments have a little bit broader uh, reach or rationale as they encompass more scientific endeavors, uh, human and cultural histories um, to kind of designate those two. Those are far from the only designations that our federal government or state governments use uh, in protecting lands. You can see here, we've got a whole bunch of different designations that are used, each with their own different rationale and purpose for setting aside lands for different uses, different purposes, um, and for different regions. Places like marine sanctuaries, wild and scenic river systems, national forests, land of many uses. Um, each one has their own rules, regulations, and rationales behind being established. But today we are going to go into um, Acadia National Park, which was once Lafayette National Monument, which was once a crazy French term that I cannot pronounce, National Monument too. But before we go into the formation of even National Monument, National Monument, National Park, we got to talk about how the heck this region actually formed and why it looks the way it does today. Often I associate glaciers only with these big mountain ranges, thinking of the high Sierra or the Rocky Mountains, 10,000 plus feet above sea level, where it's not too hard to imagine big old glacial blocks of ice carving and cutting out paths in the granite. But Acadia National Park is another good example of glacial activity. We can see 21,000 years ago, during one of our most recent ice ages, uh, this entire region in Maine, right here where my cursor is at, uh, was covered by snow and glaciers. Those glaciers helped form the mountains, hills that we see in the park today, and also led to sea level rise, um, kind of disconnecting some of that land, uh, some islands from the land and what once may have been connected, now we see in the form of a bunch of disjointed islands which we'll take a look at right here. As we go ahead and zoom in, we can see all these different dots of land, just these little islands peeking up out of the ocean, inlets, estuaries, peninsulas, all sorts of stuff going on. And this main island right here is the vast majority of Acadia National Park. We'll jump in to this shot of a map of the national park itself. Unlike a lot of national parks, I usually think of Yellowstone, which is that big, perfect square of protected lands, Acadia National Park is relatively disjointed in terms of what lands fall under what designation. Part of this reason comes, comes from the fact that European settlers settled this area far before the establishment of the National Park Service in 1919, um, and it was kind of difficult to re-require lands to be protected. But even before we have that conversation, it's important to acknowledge the fact that indigenous peoples, four main tribes, were living here up to 12,000 years ago. We have evidence of human history, of human habitation on these islands. Probably as those glaciers receded, um, this land all of a sudden was abundant with fish, with wildlife, with flowers, and everything that folks needed to call this place home. Uh, two of these tribes, the Penobscot and the, 
always mess up this name, the Micmac, um, called this area home. And they used, or people used, a uh, larger, a broader designated term of the Wabanaki, or the people of the Dawnland which I think is a super poetic name coming from the fact that the sun rises in the east and this would have been the most westward land uh, to see that sunrise. And people kind of used that name, people of the dawn land. Super cool name. But eventually, uh, all good things must come to an end. Uh, Samuel Champlain, a French explorer, was one of the first persons of European descent to discover, in air quotes, this region. Sam Champlain set up a small colony group of people, um, and they lived in relative harmony with those Wabanaki people, trading, uh, helping each other out, trying to make a living off this rocky coastline. And many of them used uh, the ocean as their primary source of food, doing a lot of fishing. Um, Sam Champlain was out here 16 years prior to the pilgrims, uh, but that early establishment did not last long as a British explorer, Sam Argall, eventually came out um, and destroyed the settlement that Samuel Champlain and his group had created. Um, this threw this entire region into a state of limbo, uh, political limbo, between being New France and New England, um, which lasted a really long time. Regardless of the political designation, uh, folks eventually, people of European descent, eventually found their way out to places like Bar Harbor, this big bustling uh, village, town, city that we see today. And again, they made their living uh, mainly off the ocean, doing a lot of fishing for sustenance. Paper mills eventually popped up here. There's a surprising amount of industry despite harsh winters uh, and rugged coastline. After some of those early settlers came, the area began to continue to be developed and eventually rusticators, rich folks from elsewhere in the colonies or other uh, settlements of European descent came out here as a form of tourism. These early rusticators were artists, poets, writers that sought to capture the beauty of the relatively underdeveloped area, um, like the fall foliage, the rivers, uh, the ocean, those estuaries that we saw from that overhead. Um, and in their works of art, they created a lot of hype for this area. More and more tourists came out as railroads came, as the place continued to be developed, um, and Acadia became a tourist attraction. And with all that being said, we think the name Acadia comes from uh, the fact that it looks kind of like the Greek Isles, Acadia being a Greek word. And those rusticators came out, these rich folks wearing their fancy hats, came out to picnic and take a little holiday away from the bustling cities and more metropolis areas uh, like New York and Boston and Philadelphia. Um, the Wabanaki people still were living in this area at the time. Um, and they found a way to work with these early visitors with this example of providing guided tours in birch bark, traditional birch bark canoes that they'd come out here. And they're those same fancy hat rusticators, those same early tourists uh, that were following in their footsteps, only digital footsteps. So from Bar Harbor, Bar Harbor's got a cool little natural feature too, where we've got all this ocean separating Bar Harbor, the town, from this little island right here. And two times a day, as the tide changes, a land bridge forms so you can actually drive out. So yeah, we are now digitally standing right where there was 12 feet of ocean. The tide here shifts 10 to 12 feet twice a day. Um, and you can actually drive your car out here or walk and take a hike to get out to the island. See, there's a truck right there. Proof, evidence. Uh, tides have always been tricky for me for whatever reason, but I thought this was a cool little infograph showing that the combined gravitational pull of the sun and the moon really stretch those tides, bring more water from Earth to two different sides. And that's why we have these areas of high tides and low tides that change as the Earth rotates and as the Earth orbits and sun and moon orbit too. Let's take a peek at one more piece of evidence. It's not a very it's kind of a granulated picture, um, but do be careful to read those tide charts before you go exploring uh, by car, as those tides do change and drastically, and you might get stuck in a situation. I don't know what these kayakers are gonna do other than retrieve a couple cell phones, see if they can tow that thing back. There's no way. Let's go ahead and keep on jumping from our land bridge and Bar Harbor and early settlement to what looks almost like a California beach over here. Uh, Sand Dollar Beach is just one more draw for 
previous historic tourism and tourism of today. And while you're on Sand Dollar Beach, you may see this little guy right here, a harbor seal hanging out. If you ever see a harbor seal pup that looks like he's stranded on the beach, just hanging out all by himself, please don't go up to him. Please don't mess with him. Mom has just left him there while she goes to hunt. Um, and he is 100% okay on his own. Mom will come back. The harbor seals are cool because they are relatively homely. They like this place and they don't usually leave it. They stay within kind of a five to 10 mile radius uh, of the place that they call home. No migration, no really chasing fish or leaving with the weather. Um, they call this place home and they live mainly, not often on the beach where the pup may leave to hang out, um, but they're mainly hanging out in the sea. Their heart rate can go from 100 beats per minute down to 10 beats per minute as they submerge and hunt for fish under there. And these big whiskers that he has right here help him. They're kind of like his sonar. They're super duper sensitive to help him navigate underwater and find the fish and figure out just where the heck he's going in these colder waters in California. We'll keep on traveling around from Sand Dollar Beach as we make our way up to the Beehive, kind of a famous hike in this region. Um, and as you're hiking with these sweeping views of the ocean, you may see a porcupine. The name comes from kind of quilled pig, and they are super cute, um, but kind of prickly. Uh, despite them having quills, people that have played too much Pokemon or watched too much TV might think they can shoot these quills at you. Porcupines cannot shoot their quills. Um, they will slap with their tails or turn their back to predators uh, to be protected. Um, and sometimes with that slap of the tail, loose quills will fall out, but they can't actually fire them at people. And a fun fact about the porcupine, these quills actually have an anti-infectal agent. Um, in case they accidentally prick themselves, they won't become uh, infected. So protection from themselves and protection from other animals too. But these guys like to forage around on all the trails. So you are more than, you definitely might see one um, if you're hiking around further away from those developed areas. Another animal that you might see out here is the fox. Foxes are solitary creatures. They don't like hanging out in big groups. I like to think of them instead of like a coyote or a dog. They're really cat-like in how they hunt um, and hang out independently, foraging, hunting all around the area. Let's move on from the beehive and some of the animals that we might find there up to Cadillac Mountain and talk about some of the birds that we might see. Cadillac Mountain is one of the most popular spots because of huge, gorgeous views just like this. And when you're up there, you may see peregrine falcons flying around. Peregrine falcons are super cool birds of prey um, that can stoop or dive bomb up to 100 miles an hour as they're hunting. One of the fastest animals on the planet, and I believe the fastest bird too, they're incredible hunters. I was watching a flock of ducks one time on the Colorado and all these hundred ducks took off one way and all of a sudden one of the ducks just took a right hand turn and smashed into the side of the mountain. I had blinked and I had missed a peregrine falcon striking down its prey. Super cool animals um, and this is what they look like. They get really aerodynamic as they again stoop or kind of dive bomb on stuff that is really unlucky. Another animal that you might see circling around is the bald eagle. Bald eagles are not bald after they kind of leave adolescence and enter adulthood. They get that white head on them. Um, and bald eagles aren't as good a hunter as peregrine falcons. They're more opportunistic animals. They're, they'll eat carry-on or dead stuff. They'll hunt in garbage cans. Um, they definitely will fish and do that, but they won't pass up a meal if they see it otherwise. Uh, Benjamin Franklin actually wasn't a super duper big fan of the bald eagle as the symbol of the US because of this, because they'd steal from others uh, and they don't have that prototypical, you know, that like screech that you hear in movies whenever a bald eagle flies over, they're actually kind of squeaky. They sound like they're giggling when they talk to each other. That screech that you hear in movies is actually usually a red tail hawk being dubbed over a bald eagle to give it a more heroic, uh, more romanticized cry. Ben Franklin, while he didn't formally call for it, uh, in a couple of letters, he celebrated the native bird, the turkey because of its history with indigenous folks um, and what he thought was a little bit more better representation than the bald eagle. Though again, he never formally declared that he wanted a big old turkey on a flag. Uh, interesting to see a take uh, on something different than our otherwise romanticized 
bald eagle. Let's go ahead and beat the crowds from Cadillac Mountain. Actually, we're gonna go into even more crowds as we catch Cadillac Mountain in the sunset. Again, we've just hiked about five minutes away from that other spot to catch a killer sunset, um, probably in the winter as it's setting low over these islands. Um, but that red sky is also reminiscent of 1947, which was the year that Maine burned. A lot of those rusticators, a lot of that development that we saw as early tours came out and a bunch of rich folks um, from other cities came out. They had built up these massive cottages that were often a hundred rooms um, for people like John D. Rockefeller Jr. Uh, but a lot of this human history, this development history was lost in 1947 as massive, massive swaths of the islands and of Acadia National Park burned down. As you can see in this picture, 17,000 acres of Mount Desert, the name of the mountain, um, was burned that year. A lot of history was lost, a lot of architecture was lost, um, but the park was not, and everything rebounded to what you see today. We'll keep on jumping from this beautiful sunset to one area that was burned down, but rebuilt um, in the Jordan Pond House where you can stop while you're hiking, get a little lunch, have a little tea, and overlook Jordan Pond right here, off in the background. If you're lucky, you may see some loons floating around out on the water. The loon is this massive waterfowl with that kind of haunting call that you've probably heard um, in movies, you know, as the mist rises. Um, it's a really eerie sounding call. Um, but loons are not scary despite their call. Um, they're really neat animals that are super protective of their young. When hunters like foxes come along, they'll actually throw their chick on their back like in this picture and make their way to the water to be a little bit safer. Um, they're called loons because they're kind of clumsy, as silly as this sounds. Um, the name loon came from them looking loony as they walked around a little less elegantly than they swim or fly. Kind of clumsy when they're on land. Another animal that you might see is the beaver, Castor canadensis, my favorite Latin name. Uh, beavers are really cool and really massive in this area too. These guys can grow up to be 60 pounds, little furry bowling balls, um, and they got big old incisor teeth where they can eat and cut down trees. Their bodies can actually digest cellulose, so they're also eating while they work. Snack and work at the same time, keep their energy level up, but they need all that energy to build dams, to stop up streams um, and create lodges. Uh, wooden structures, sticks that are eight, that can be eight feet wide by three feet tall. So these relatively big homes um, that they that they hang out in colonies. They have big old families that they live in. Um, they've got translucent eyelids, so they got built-in goggles, um, waterproof fur, so they do hang out here even when these uh, lakes get iced over um, and the temperatures drop in the winter. They are staying. They built their home. They're going to hang out here. They're in it for the long haul. But beavers are another cool animal that you may see out here. Don't get them confused for the porcupines. Um, one good way to make your way to Jordan Pond House is via the carriage roads. Carriage roads are a cool element of human history where that development, more and more people are coming out here, buying up land, building these massive cottages. People like George Dorr, Charles Elliott, and John D. Rockefeller Jr. saw the need to protect this land for future generations and to kind of prohibit some of that larger development. Um, in an effort to protect those lands, they started up buying up available lands as the Hancock County Trust, a group of really rich, really well-educated people too. Charles Elliott was like a president of Harvard. Um, Rockefeller Jr. came from a ton of oil money, but they ended up buying up more and more land with the purpose of donating it to the National Park System or National Monument System eventually. Uh, George Dorr was the first superintendent of the National Monument, uh, that French word which eventually became Lafayette National Monument, which eventually became Acadia National Park, and again, uh, Rockefeller Jr. Um, in particular built 45 miles of carriage roads, no vehicles allowed, because he loved horseback riding um, and just being driven by cart through the fall. As you can see, all these leaves changing color. Fall's a super duper popular time to come visit the park specifically for that region. But thanks to these gentlemen, um, they collected, they bought up all the land 
again, back to this picture of the park as we know it today, which is why it's so disjointed. Places like Bar Harbor were not bought up by the Hancock County Trust, um, but enough was to establish a national monument and national park. We'll keep on cruising around to Thunder Hole as we go out to the ocean. This is a popular drive in a popular spot. Where you can see incoming waves hit against these rocks and shoot up water in almost 40 foot tall, uh, massive plumes of water. But a lot of these trails, a lot of these roads weren't built by the Hancock County Trust, but were built by the 1933 uh, Civilian Conservation Corps an effort by FDR and the New Deal. Um, thousands and thousands of young men were put to work during the Great Depression by the federal government um, in order to continue building up these parks for the enjoyment and perpetual use of people. The Civilian Conservation Corps is responsible for work in a whole bunch of different parks, but Acadia in particular um, has a lot of their lasting impact to help create the park as we see it today. We'll go ahead and jump a little bit down the road from Thunder Hole to Otter Cliffs. And while we can't see any otters today, we probably won't be able to see puffins. But there are a whole bunch of puffins in this set of islands. And puffins are really cool. They're a pelagic bird, meaning they spend the vast majority of their life in the pelagic zone, which is this little tiny surface level of the sea where they hunt for fish like these two had a whole big old collection in their rainbow colored bills. Those rainbow colors are helpful in attracting a mate. And then if successful, puffins do mate for life. Um, so these two may be husband and wife and hanging out for a really long time. They re raise chicks in burrows. So not only can they fly, they can walk a little bit more successfully than the loons. They can swim and dive for fish, but they can also burrow or carve out holes in those island sides, um, which are a little bit more protected from predators like foxes. A really cool bird, the puffin. Do I have another picture on the puffin? No, just this one. Um, yeah, as they mate for life, hunt for fish, and raise chicks together. Again, you probably won't see them from otter cliffs, but tours out to different islands, or I was reading Norway. There's a whole bunch of puffins if your heart is set on one, seeing these kind of parrots of the sea. We'll keep on moving from otter cliff, or excuse me, ocean path, jumped ahead of myself, to Otter Cliffs now as we continue taking this road up the coast. Otter Cliffs is a popular spot not for puffins, but for people. Uh, folks come to Otter Cliffs, cliffs like these, to take part in rock climbing. And these folks right here are doing a little bit of top roping where they anchor this rope to the top of the cliff and then they can climb up and down with the protection of that rope. Um, there's really cool designations for rock climbing and different classifications. And a super easy way to remember them is uh, one is if you could hop on one foot down a trail. Two is if you could walk nice and comfortably down a trail. Uh, three, you may need to get a hand involved, three limbs involved to make your way over rocks. Four, probably going to need two hands involved. And finally, five is where you need two feet, two hands, and a rope. There's a whole bunch of different ways for folks to go out uh, more accessible too and more tools. So that's by no means the only way of accessing and seeing these places, but that's just my easy way of remembering it. So five again is we need that rope involved. And then from five, it goes 5.01 to 5.13 and then ABCD. So when you're going rock climbing in Yosemite National Park, you might get to those 513Ds, things that are just crazy steep, overhung, where you almost go upside down with it. But these folks are doing some rock climbing right here. And again, top roping, using ropes, anchors, harnesses, uh, belaying devices, all to do this recreational activity nice and safely. Finally, from Otter Cliffs, we're going to go ahead and jump over to our last spot on the tour. And really that prototypical postcard picture that you'll probably see or when you bring up that Acadia website at nps.gov. Um, but this is Bass Harbor Lighthouse, a project that was completed in 1858, maybe by the, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Don't actually know. But this lighthouse in particular was only $5,000 to build um, and has since undergone some renovations. So it is not the original. Um, but again, really that prototypical, that postcard picture of Maine that you might see with a sunrise or a sunset, 
depending on what time of day it is. Uh, makes for a really good photo opportunity as you go down Ocean Path, maybe try and beat the crowds of Cadillac Mountain. So that's all I got for you today. Thank you for joining me for this quick tour of Acadia National Park. Again, check out that website at nps.gov. You can find your way to Acadia and find your way to some supplementary websites uh, to learn more about the park or learn more about subjects that were interesting to you. Uh, thank you again for joining us and we hope you come out for more virtual tours, either recorded or live, as we do them Mondays at 6 p.m. Pacific time and Thursdays, uh, 12 p.m. noon Pacific time. We are gonna continue doing national parks, but we're also starting to get a little bit international as we check out some of the world's oceans, places like Japan, do some ancient wonders and new wonders of the world. Um, there's a never ending supply of subject matter to tour all from the comfort of your couch. Thanks again, and I'll see you soon.